The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast. The only podcast which is devoted to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, SignalR, and not forgetting the .NET Core community itself. I am your host, Jamie Gaprogaman Taylor, and this is episode 48, Rockstar with Dylan Beatty. In this episode, I interviewed Dylan about Rockstar, but we also talked about whether the work that we do as software engineers, coders, programmers, whatever you want to call yourself, whether it should be treated like engineering and have a code of standards and ethics. We also talked about code as art versus code as science. This was an incredibly engrossing conversation about some of the topics that we don't usually talk about in our field, and I'm sure you're going to love it. One thing to note, this episode was recorded in the fishbowl at NDC London 2020. As such, the audio is a little less polished than I would have liked, and it's a little rough at times, but that was entirely down to my post-production skills. Remember that the full transcription is available at the show's website, which is available at .netcore.show. The transcription was produced in collaboration with Productivity in Tech. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .net new podcast, and let this show begin. First thing I'd like to say, Dylan, is thank you ever so much for spending some time. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, you know, my first time at NDC, and I can understand that it's very, it's a very busy uh, thing. Everybody's got there's five talks every hour. There's lots of things going on, lots of new things to learn, and lots of people to meet and talk to. So the thing that you sort of figure out fairly quickly with an event like like NDC, because I, I do lots of conferences, you know, big ones, small ones, little community events. Um, and when it's your kind of first time, you're looking at the program and thinking, I want to see all these talks, and that one clashes with that one, and that one clashes with that one. And actually, there's no way of seeing all of it. Like, completely forget whatever it is that you choose to do. There's going to be an entire track of stuff that you'll regret not seeing. But, you know, one, a lot of the talks, NDC does a great job on recording, and, you know, everything will be on the internet eventually. So the talks you didn't see, you can watch them later on YouTube. But the things, you know, people really remember, and this is something I found and something lots of people have said to me, is you don't remember necessarily the talks you went to. You remember the people you spoke to and the conversations you had and, you know, the, the ideas and those kinds of things. And so if there's ever a choice between like having an interesting conversation with somebody or trying to figure out which talk to go to, you go for the conversation because the conversations are where the ideas kind of germinate and, you know, business partnerships are born and open source projects get started and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I love uh, watching speakers. I love presenting. I really enjoy the format. But, you know, that kind of stuff, there are ways of picking up on that later if you didn't get to see it. Whereas conversations, if you miss the opportunity to do that, you can't. Go and do that later on YouTube. Absolutely, you know, uh, I brought in my friend Alan just mm-hmm. now, you know, to, to introduce him to you because, you know, that's a connection. Maybe he can talk to you about something. Maybe you can talk to him about something. And yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll admit to having sort of wide-eyed, starry-eyed Sunday afternoon walking around in the hotel, going, "Oh my goodness, there's Dylan BT, there's <laughs> Troy Hunt, there's." I got a nod from um, Carl Franklin, and that made my day. I was like, "Holy cow!" I didn't even say hello; he just sort of nodded at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I need to go have a lay down, you know. <laughs> there's this wonderful anecdote um, from uh, Duff McKagan, who's the, the bass player with Guns N' Roses. His autobiography is a wonderful book. Um, and there's this, this bit at the end, he, uh, kind of story of his life after Guns N' Roses kind of sold millions of records. He discovered he had no money because of, you know, record company accounting and this kind of stuff. So he went back to school. He went to college to study business. And, you know, he wrote magazine columns and stuff. Um, but there's this lovely, he ends the book with, um, They've just come off stage doing a concert in South America and there's, you know, fans lining the streets back to his hotel shouting, Duff, Duff, Duff. Um, and he gets into a, the hotel and they're like, oh, there's a message for you. Um, and it's his college professor. And he calls him back and goes, you know, hello, it, it's Duff McKagan. And um, the professor goes, sorry, who? And he's like, I'm in your business finance class. Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, and I, I love that because it establishes, you know, context. Within a certain kind of niche or a bubble, you can be really, really well known. And people kind of, I mean, I, everyone in technology I've ever met is lovely. 
you know, it's just because someone's got a, a podcast or they got their own blog or, I mean, you know, Troy Hunt's kind of different because he gets called on mainstream TV and he's like testified before Congress and stuff. Um, so he's probably somebody who might get recognized even if you're not part of our little echo chamber, you know. Um, but the rest of us are just the same as everyone else. We're just a little bit louder. <laughs> That's know? it, right? And I'm, I'm sure the same thing happens at other conferences for, say, business conferences yeah. or music conferences or um, what are the A&R conferences, you know? Oh, my goodness, it's that person. Oh, my goodness, it's that person. Actually, yeah. I, I got invited to uh, do a keynote at Flutter Europe uh, last week in, in Warsaw. Um, which was great, but it's a, you know, completely different set of people to kind of the, the NDC familiar faces and the regulars and everything. Um, and it was kind of interesting because, you know, for the first time in a long while, I turned up to a conference where it's unfamiliar with the technology stack because I've not really used Flutter very much at all. Um, and I didn't know anybody there and they had no idea who I was. Um, and, you know, so you kind of like, all right, let's have a drink and talk to strangers and try and, you know, figure this out and make some friends and have some conversations. Um, and it's kind of weird because the first time everybody does it, it's always like that. It's like, oh, everybody here knows each other and I don't know anybody and I don't fit in and I'm going to go and hide in my hotel. Um, and then you realize nobody knows each other. They're just, they've figured that out already. So, but anyway. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, we've talked about this wonderful stuff for about five minutes now. Yeah. I haven't even introduced you. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, like I said, thank you ever so much for, you know, taking the time. And, um, I was wondering, could you give us a brief introduction to, you know, some of the work you do, especially Rockstar and mm -hmm. like the linebackers and things like that? So yeah, I'm Dylan Beatty. I'm a, as of today, I am an independent software consultant. I literally just before we did this, um, tweeted out my new company, which is called Ursatile, Ursa like the bear, um, independent software training and consultancy and that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to plug that now because I need clients. Of so course. get in touch, ursatile.com, and, and we can work together and stuff. Um, I've also been building websites since the, I think I built my first web page in 1992, which was about a year after the kind of HTML 1.0 was was drafted as a specification. Um, I started building data-driven web applications, you know, classic ASP running off access databases way back in the late 1990s. Been building websites ever since. Um, websites that kind of grew and grew until I was hiring teams and studying distributed systems and, uh, you know, software architecture, all these kinds of ideas. And uh, yeah, over the last sort of um, five years or so, I've been speaking at conferences, meetups, doing more and more stuff with community, training, teaching. Uh, you know, the, the, the strap line I have on my website is uh, I do interesting things with computers, video, music, and comedy, and then I travel all over the world and talk to people about it, which kind of sums it up. So I love nerdy things. I love, <laughs> I love using technology for unintended purposes and seeing what you can make it do. So. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I um, think I was talking to Clifford earlier on today, and he, you know, we were talking about. Uh, I think people like himself. He's making the IoT hand for yeah. the young gentleman who has unfortunately not got a left hand. And uh, we were talking about Scott Hanselman, who's got diabetes, and he's open sourced that. It's like using the domain knowledge and the, the expertise mm -hmm. that we have to try and solve the problems we see around us, and that's amazing that we can do that. You know, I mean, I think you know some of the most compelling solutions that technology has created um, are because somebody who understands the capability and you know the constraints around that technology is trying to solve a problem that they care about the solution they don't care about the paycheck or the kudos or whatever they're doing it because they want this thing solved there's a, a fantastic book about the development of the iPhone um, which it, it, the format's wonderful it, it kind of alternates how they develop the device with the supply chain for the current manufacturing process which is really really interesting um, but basically you know the, the iPhone story has it it's the phone Steve Jobs wanted because he didn't like any of the other ones um, and you know he's somebody who obviously understood technology and everything and there were entire teams at Apple you know Steve Steve Jobs was this famously mercurial personality if you caught him on a bad day it could end very badly for you and so they got all these teams working on things like multi-touch displays and you know touch screens and this kind of stuff and they're like when do we tell Steve if we tell him too early before it's ready he'll fire us all for wasting his time if we leave it too late he'll fire us all for not telling him earlier 
And so they had teams where somebody's job was to talk to Steve every morning and find out what mood is he in, um, and then go back and go, today's the day. We're going to show Steve Jobs multi-touch this afternoon. So they'd have demos ready to go every single day. Um, but, you know, the first iPhone was Steve Jobs going, I want to build a phone that, as a business person and an entrepreneur, I want the phone that I wish I had. Um, and, you know, the same with, with that whole kind of Apple's renaissance in the 90s and early 2000s. The iPhone, iPod, the kind of rebooted iMac, the, uh, the operating system, Mac OS X and stuff. Um, and, you know, I think some of the best software that exists is people who are really good at developing, building the application they want to use. You look at some uh, developer tool trains, like, you know, Visual Studio Code is built by developers using Visual Studio Code, and if something doesn't work for them, they fix it, and they push it, and it, it happens. Um, and some of my favorite games, you know, back in the days when a, a tiny team of people, Doom, Quake, those kinds of things, those folks were building the games they wanted to play. And then it's like, all right, we're happy with it, maybe somebody else will like this. And of course, it was a you know massive success. And yeah, you know, I, I think that you mentioned uh, Scott Hanselman and his, his talk about open source uh, diabetes is, is absolutely fascinating. I saw him do it at a Dev Sum in Stockholm last year. Um, and, you know, it's eye-opening to realize there's kind of all this technology that is amazing, but none of it is officially good enough to use for anything medical because they're like, well, it's an amazing revolutionary smartphone, but oh no, don't trust your life with it. It might crash at any moment for no reason. Um, and you're like, but... Who decides whether it's worth the risk? You know, is that the, do we allow the individuals to do that? Is that a certification thing? Is that a, you know, some kind of medical board? Is that government legislation? You know, if you want to trust your iPhone to tell you whether your pancreas is working properly that day, who decides whether you're allowed to do that or not? And that's really, really interesting stuff. So. Yeah, it, it fits. I've gone a little bit off topic, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> That's it, a podcast. Yeah, know. right? Yeah. We can edit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'll just put it out. But um, it kind of fits well with the, the keynote that mm. uh, I don't know whether you were in the keynote or not, but the keynote I just watched was basically ethics yeah. in AI, right? And I've been saying to a few people so far, you know, that talk really sort of reinforces this idea that maybe we should have the Hippocratic Oath for development. Is this going to do harm? Or yeah. can I put something in place that will stop it from doing harm? Or say I'm developing a system that catalogs people and segregates them by some measure. Does that have the capacity to do harm? Uh, yeah. The quote that, that was put up there was about the, the engineer of the, the rockets for, for Second World War Germany, you know. Yeah. That engineer was saying, I'm sending rockets to the moon, but yeah. they landed in London. You know, yeah. it's where do you draw that line? You know, it's Von Braun, wasn't it? The V2 was a good rocket. It just landed on the wrong planet. Exactly. Um, and uh, I don't know if you saw the, the For All Mankind series that Apple TV just premiered with, uh, which is kind of alternate history of the space race. The Soviets got to the moon first. And so, you know, the Apollo program kept going and going and going. Um, and that, I thought, dealt with the whole, um, you know, the, the, the ethics of engineering around that in quite a sensitive and nuanced way. Um, it could have been a, you know, a bit of a, a whitewash, and it, it wasn't. It actually got into a lot of issues I thought they, they weren't going to tackle. Um, but, you know, one of the, the challenges around ethics and, you know, professional accountability in software engineering is we don't have the, the sort of liability chain. You know, you write your code and um, there's a kind of idea floating around that, you know, the distinction between like a, a coder or a developer hack or whatever you want and an engineer is that an engineer accepts professional liability for the consequences of the work they do, which is true in, you know, aviation engineering, in structural engineering, civil engineering. But, you know, you, you design a building and the building falls down. There is a well-established protocol for identifying liability. Was it, you know, you specified steel of a certain specification. Did the steel that was supplied conform to the specification? If not, then the supplier there is held to be liable. If the correct steel was supplied, but then it wasn't assembled correctly, then the contractors can be held to be liable. Um, and, you know, every single computer, you've got a CPU that might have Meltdown or Spectre lurking in it that nobody knows about, running an operating system where you accept the terms and conditions which say, I promise I will not use this to run life support systems, nuclear reactors, air traffic control, anything that matters. And then you're expected to drop your code on top of that and say, yes, I will stake my reputation that this is not going to crash. Um, you know, you ever hear about a court case where a developer is going, actually, this was a CPU problem? or a memory problem. And there are specialist applications, uh, you know, medicine, aviation, where lives are at stake, where, um, you know, you'd like to think that the whole thing is a lot more rigorous. Certainly friends of mine who work on software for uh, healthcare 
they talk about like a nine month release cycle. We're talking about, you know, 10 deploys a day. And they're like, you can't do 10 deploys a day to all of the MRI scanners in Pennsylvania because you'll kill people if there's a mistake. We have a nine month certification and rollout process. Um, and you're like, well, if it takes nine months to ship software that you know isn't going to crash, how are we getting away with doing it 10 times a day? You know, um, and a lot of the time it's because if it crashes, you just reboot and start again and it doesn't matter. But the world is changing fast. People often ask, you know, why are software engineers not held to the same standards as construction engineers? I'm like, we haven't killed enough people yet. Um, and, you know, I hope we don't, but it is possible that we will continue operating in this kind of, you know, wonderful space of uh, just right click, deploy to production, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Um, until something drastic, you know, something terrible might happen. And then it'll be like, okay, everyone, hang on a second. I don't know. I have no idea how we're going to get there. But, you know, there are these well-documented incidents. There was the Comet aircraft in the 1950s and 60s, um, which, you know, famously took down an entire airline or an entire manufacturing company. Uh, there was the Kansas City shopping mall collapse in the 1970s, which led to lots and lots of regulation around structural engineering. Um, you know, you can you can highlight these incidents, and I don't think in software we really have one yet. You know, the the Therac radiation machines, the example we all learn about in school, um, which uh, I don't know if you know the history. It was a um, radiation radiotherapy for cancer patients, um, and you type in the dosage like one zero zero zero, and if you press backspace, it would take a zero off the display, but it wouldn't lower the radiation dose of the machine. So people got 10, 100, a couple of cases, a thousand times more radiation than they were supposed to have got. It killed people. But, you know, that's something we, we learn about in school. It's not kind of mainstream in our industry, I don't think. So. It's, it's jolly interesting stuff. And, you know, maybe we should have an ethics. Maybe, we, you know, but how, like you say, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where do we, are we in a position where we need people to have passed on or people to be harmed in some way so that we get there. It's a really interesting topic. I, you know, like I said, I really, really hope that we can find our own way there without somebody else having to intervene. Um, you know, I, I enjoy working in technology and software because it's a wonderful combination of creativity and problem solving and, you know, um, sort of creative expression allied to engineering rigor and discipline and stuff. Maybe it might become necessary, but I'd hate to work in a world where all your software has to be licensed and reviewed before you're allowed to deploy to production. Like you say, you kind of have 10 deploys a day if you're doing that. Yeah. But then, um, you know, I, I've worked at um, small consultancies or agencies where it's you build this thing for this client and three months later you've stopped building it, you're moving on to something else. Yeah. Where's the liability like that? Is yeah. it, it's a scary situation. And like junior developers who are just coming in who maybe start doing web dev yeah. if the website crashes yeah. maybe no one's going to get harmed but then maybe that harms the bottom line it's all turtles all the way down somebody yeah. needs a lot of very smart people to get together and actually figure it all out and there are imbalances here i remember years ago a um, friend of mine was uh, studying to become a lawyer and for various arcane historical reasons the legal qualification process in the uk basically involves jumping through arbitrary hoops for three years in a row and they have these application windows where you have to submit applications to various you know, legal firms to do internships and stuff. Um, and it's all run through a centralized agency. And the software that's used for this was, I mean, horrific. It was one of the worst pieces of user interface design and reliability I think I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, the people who built it, I'm guessing it was just one outsource project of thousands that they did that year. But to these students, you know, that's if they miss this window they are not going to qualify as a lawyer because there is no redress, there's no negotiation, there's no appeals process. You have to work out how to get through their shitty website to get your details. And at that point, you go and go, did that even work? I don't know. You know, you sort of want to sit the, the developers down with the people doing it and go, your code is making somebody cry at three o'clock in the morning because your crappy error handling might jeopardize their entire career. You know, how do you feel about that? So I think some developers would be like, yeah, we didn't get paid enough to do it properly. I think some developers would be like, it was just a job. I think some developers would be like, oh my God, we need to fix this. This is not acceptable. We need to do better. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of the, the sort of the work that I've been doing and the work I'm, I'm hoping to do a lot more of is about, you know, improving that understanding on both sides. You know, you've got your users, you have your, your stakeholders, and you have your developers. 
Um, and the users are there to you know tell a story. They want to accomplish something. Um, the stakeholders want to, in most cases, benefit from streamlining this process. And the developers are the ones who can make it happen. You know, we have the capability to build the technology and the systems and and whatnot. Um, and you know, done well, like we we touched on with the you know the bionic hand and that kind of thing. Um, that feedback loop is high bandwidth. It's very very tightly coupled. And if something is is not quite right. It's immediately apparent the developers go in, they can improve it. Um, but sometimes, you know, there's a spec that someone signed off on six months ago, it ends up on your desk. You can't get hold of any of the people. Maybe you don't even know what the system is for. You've just been told to build this design and do this code with it. And, you know, if you don't do that, you don't get paid. Exactly, so. right? I might be creating some kind of method or module that just does one thing. It takes a number, it gives you a different number. I may not have a full 10,000 foot view of where that slots in. Am I responsible for if that thing is used to harm people? Yeah, we we're talking earlier about uh, you know the, the V two rockets and World War Two and stuff, and there's a a, a story which I, may be apocryphal. I, I suspect it isn't. Um, that when Oppenheimer was designing the atomic bomb, at some point one of the calculations he thought, if I've got the numbers wrong, I might set the Earth's atmosphere on fire. And so the whole project, you know, is completely top secret classified. And so he isolated that part of the mathematics and gave it to a couple of his graduate students and said, can you just check the workings on here? Um, and, you know, they all went, yeah, it's fine. And apparently one of them came back to him and went, is this what I think it is? And he said, come in here, you need to sign the official secrets act and you're not allowed to tell anybody about this ever and stuff. Um, and, you know, three of the grad students were like, this is interesting maths. And one of them goes are you using me to check whether you're going to destroy the world? You know, um, and it's, you know, context is, is vital, but at the same time, abstractions are a necessary part of allowing us to get a handle on the individual parts of the work we're doing so we don't get overwhelmed by the whole thing, you know. Of course, yeah. So, and where you draw that line and, and how much you allow to sort of permeate across that boundary is so, so important to getting those, those processes to work effectively. It so. really is, it really is. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It, it, it. Like you said earlier, we divulged slightly from the planned topic, but I like it. Okay, so in the past, before I uh, mm -hmm. looked into Rockstar, which hopefully yeah. we're going to get the chance to talk about today, I'd heard of a number of esoteric programming languages. Yes. We've got uh, Intercal, which yep. requires a level of politeness. We've got Ook, which is based on the yeah. mutterings of a certain orangutan librarian. And, you know, uh, uh, one that I can't say the name of just because it's... Uh, well, BF. Yeah, yeah, BF, right? In polite company. Exactly, right. And I think there's one uh, chef or something like that where oh, you yeah, have to yeah. write out recipes. Uh, was that your goal going into Rockstar? So, you know, I'd always liked, I like esoteric languages. Um, and there's a bunch of languages out there which are, they're what's called Turing tar pits. Um, it, it, somebody calculated that you need eight instructions to build a Turing machine. You're basically, you know, increment the pointer, decrement the pointer, input, output, and, and four other codes that I, I can't remember what they are. Um, and so languages like, like BF and OOK and a whole bunch of others, basically, they, like OOK is just the word OOK with eight different kinds of punctuation. And so OOK with an exclamation mark is output the value that is currently at the top of the stack. OOK with a question mark is read standard in and put it on top of the stack. Um, and so, you know, the program's just OOK, 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 um, which is kind of, it's a joke. Um, and, you know, it's, it's relatively trivial now to build compilers for those kinds of languages, and there's lots of those. But the esoteric languages that I really fascinate me are... The ones that try and incorporate idioms from another domain where there are strong conventions around stuff. Um, there is a, a module for Perl, Perla Lingua Romana, which allows you to write Perl code in Latin. And Latin grammar has this very formal system of singular and plural and subjects and objects. And so um, Damien Conway is the, the person who created this. This is way back in the early 2000s. He incorporated the rules of Latin grammar as a substitute for the syntax of Perl operations. So the difference between modifying a variable as a scalar or as an array or as a hash is now expressed by the kind of Latin grammar and the way you conjugate the verb that refers to the method that does it. And I, I thought this was brilliant. You know, I, I was actually doing Perl programming at the time. I'd never really studied Latin, but I scratched the surface a little bit. Um, and I love that way of kind of taking ideas from one domain and putting them in another. Um, and this is, it's actually what I'm, I'm talking about a lot in my, my keynote at NDC on 
not a keynote, it's a closing talk. Um, on, I, I keynoted it last week in, in Poland. Um, but my talk on Friday here at, at NDC is about the art of code and there's a big section about esoteric languages and these kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, there's languages like, you know, Chef is, is one where the program is also a recipe. And a guy called Mike Worth created a Chef program which is also an edible chocolate cake. Um, and, you know, I, I love that because you could have this, this recipe and you give it to somebody who doesn't, has never heard of chef and they think they're looking at a recipe. And if they follow the instructions, they actually end up with chocolate cake with a kind of molten chocolate sauce. Um, and uh, there's a, another language, it's called Pete, it's named after Pete Mondrian, uh, the uh, uh, expressionist, cubist, whatever, um, artist. And uh, uh, Pete programs are graphics. And the instruction set is what you do when the cursor crosses from one color region into another. Um, and so you could print out a PEEP program and hang it on the wall, and people would just think it was art. They'd have no idea they were looking at Fibonacci or, you know, a, a program that actually does something. Um, and so that, to me, you know, esoteric languages are this, this wonderful confluence of creativity just for the sake of doing something entertaining, um, and having to consider how you translate the, like I said, the idioms and the conventions of one domain into something that is rigorous enough to be compiled, but still has enough freedom of expression that you can build things like programs that are also pictures or programs that are also uh, recipes, or in the case of the Shakespeare language, programs that are also plays. Um, Shakespeare is this, this wonderful ESO lang where you you increment variables by saying flattering things about the characters and you decrement them by insulting the characters. And, um, and yeah, it looks like prose. It looks like Shakespeare plays. So <laughs> I love the idea of being able to take something that is in the Pete language, hang it on the wall and people say, yeah, that's art. And I'm like, no, that's Fizzbuzz. Yeah. <laughs> what do you call this piece? I call it Fizzbuzz. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, where's the art? Is it, is the, the art, the picture or is the art, the fact that the picture is also, a um, program. You know, I, I, I used to, Damien Hirst, the sort of, you know, notorious cele celebrated artist of the kind of the, the UK art scene in the last decade or two. Um, I remember reading a quote once that said the mistake a lot of people think, he had this famous exhibit where he, he uh, sort of shark in half and pickled it in formaldehyde or something. Um, and people were like, oh, you know, this is really weird. I'm like, no, no, you think that Damien Hirst is using formaldehyde and a shark as his medium, but actually... Those are his tools. His medium is media. He is creating artworks where the press and television and radio and, you know, the, the whole mainstream media coverage, that is actually the thing he's creating that all of us are watching. Um, the tank with the shark in it, that's like his paintbrush or, you know, his, his clay or whatever. Um, he manipulates that in a certain way and uses that as a tool to then create a media buzz, which is actually the thing about this that's interesting. Otherwise, it's just a dead shark in a tank and nobody cares, you know, um, which I thought was a very interesting perspective on the whole, you know, where, where is the creativity in this process and stuff. So, so that's the esoteric bit. So was it that that fueled the idea of, well, I want to be a rock star programmer <laughs> or was it? So it's actually, um, there was a, a Paul Stovall who uh, founded Octopus Deploy, which a lot of .NET devs use. It's a brilliant um, deployment management tool for, for .NET systems. Um, he put a thing on Twitter saying somebody should create a programming language called Rockstar um, to confuse recruiters. Um, and that was it. That was the whole thing. And, you know, I just thought Rockstar developer, Rockstar developer. And it just kind of stuck in my brain. And I, I figured somebody would do something with it. And after a week or two, like, nobody had. Um, and I thought... You know, how, how hard could it be? Um, and, you know, like a lot of, of projects that end up really gathering momentum, I did not set out to do anything other than write a parody language specification. Um, I was in a, in a bar in Sydney, and I basically sat down, you know, got a beer, opened up my laptop, and went, all right, if you were going to try and write a language where you could compile like 1980s power ballad song lyrics, um, you know, how would you, how would you do it? And I sort of drew, so the, the three 
proper programming languages that influenced this were Perl, Ruby, and VBScript. Because in differing ways, all three of those languages are, you know, Perl has this, this idea of being able to do the same thing in a lot of different ways. You should be able to express your intention in a way that feels natural and comfortable to you as a developer. Um, Ruby is very, very heavily influenced by natural language syntax and, uh, you know, very flexible, extensible language with, you know, keywords like if and unless and, you know, ways of expressing things that read naturally. Um, and VBScript, you know, is also heavily based on the idea of, of using English as a, a template for writing program code. Um, but it has some ideas around uh, function syntax and expressions. You know, VBScript, they very consciously in the language design didn't want to use curly braces and brackets and this kind of stuff. Um, because I, I guess the perception is that stuff looks scary and it'll put people off. And, you know, basic was always a very kind of friendly language aimed at beginners. And so, you know, those are kind of the influences. And I just started playing around with, okay, how would you start removing things like operators and braces and brackets? And how would you develop a syntax? And, you know, came up with stuff like, you know, addition. Okay, well, X plus Y. What about we say X with Y? You know, how much is the total? It's price with tax. All right. Um, and the price without the tax and, you know, division, we talk about um, the quantity of the product and the distance over the time. And it's like, all right, well, that's multiplication and division. Uh, get me 15 of those. Okay, 15 times that. And so, you know, this, this idea of mathematical expressions that just read like sentences. Um, and then one of the ideas I, I had for it was uh, is actually came straight from Douglas Crockford from a talk he did about the next generation of programming where he's talking about, you know, these, these Pascal case versus snake case, camel case, kebab case. And he's like, this is all because what we want are variable names with spaces in them and we can't have that. And I thought, well, I can. I'm inventing a language <laughs> in a bar as a joke. Um, and so, you know, and a little bit of thinking kind of went into this spec about how would you actually do this? Because you can't just have arbitrary variable names with spaces in them. But I like, well, really, rock songs talk about, you know, my heart and your love and her this and his that and the, the, the night and the something, something. So I'm like, all right, well, what if the, my, your, her, his, those prefixes mean that this is a two-part, you know, um, variable, like a, a common variable. Um, and also capital letters, so you can write songs about Billie Jean and Dr. Feelgood and Black Betty and, you know, these kind of these tropes. And it, it's sort of the first draft spec, I got to the point where you could write fizzbuzz in it. I had a function syntax. I had comparisons. I had loops. I had variable initialization. And, I, you know, um, idea I had, I, I didn't want like fizz equals 100 because numbers don't work in songs because they don't really sound very lyrical. So I, I invented this thing called a poetic literal where um, you, you count the lengths of the words and use the word lengths as the digits. So the, the canonical fizz buzz is uh, um, limit is a love struck lady killer. So A is one digit. Love struck is 10, but modulo 10, zero. Lady killer is 10, modulo 10 is zero. So one, zero, zero. So that's 100. Um, and that opens up all kinds of possibilities for writing, you know, because at that point you can use any six, seven, eight, whatever the, the digit you need, you can use any word. So you can write lyrics that rhyme, yes. which was something I was really keen to try and work into it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wrote this language spec and I stuck it on the internet and went to bed. Um, and the internet went, ooh, funny thing. <laughs> um, I think I got a thousand GitHub stars on the repo in 24 hours. Wow. Um, and it made, you know, Hacker News and uh, the front page of Reddit. Um, and then the, the weirdest thing that, that happened with it is I started getting people filing issues on the GitHub repo <laughs> because of ambiguities in the specification. I was like, why do you care? And they're like, I, I need to, I'm building a compiler and I don't know what to do here. Um, and within about a week, there were four or five people had built either compilers or transpilers based on this parity specification. Um, and I was just like, this is, I had no idea, you know. Um, you know, at the time I was like, I wouldn't even know how to do that. Um, and it kind of just kept buzzing along, you know, it kind of died down. And then like another, another echo chamber would find out about it and send it around all their slacks and everything. And there'd be a massive spike in, in traffic and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I sort of decided that this thing had some, it appealed to lots of people in different ways. Um, there are some really interesting ideas in there about programming language design. It's a, Interesting kind of test case for building parsers and compilers, that kind of stuff. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, 
you know, writing Rockstar programs is actually, it's, it's way more fun than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and so about a year, it was exactly a year ago, actually. It was at NDC London 2019. I decided that I wanted to officially have, you know, Rockstar 1.0. Um, and I wanted to build it myself because I'm a control freak and this is my pet project. And I was like, I want to do this. Um, so I, I basically had to learn how to build parsers and compilers and learned all about a, a fantastic thing called parsing expression grammars, which is basically a declarative form for doing pattern matching and uh, you know recursively matching tokens and syntax within an input file and translating that into and, and you know pegs can do all kinds of things. Um, you can just build transpilers where you have rules that say, well, if you see that Rockstar code, emit this JavaScript code or .NET code, and that's what actually runs. So you can build like a, a Rockstar to Python transpiler just as a grammar file. Somebody actually did that early on. Um, but I wanted to actually build a you know proper abstract syntax tree that then gets fed into an interpreter, which then runs the program and, and tells you what the output of that's going to be. So the first step was, and I did all this in JavaScript because I wanted it to run natively on the web. I wanted it to be something that ran in a browser so that, um, you know, the early ones, it's like there's a Scala implementation. There was one that was written in Rust. There's one that was in Python. But none of them had that kind of, you know, if you got like 90 seconds of somebody's curiosity before they get bored, they might open a web browser and play around with something and kind of get hooked into it. But 90 seconds is not long enough to work out how to run a Scala program unless you're already set up to do that. Um, and so I was like, it has to be on the web, has to run in a browser because I don't want security issues of you know hosting experimental language code on servers and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so I built it in JavaScript the, using a um, thing called PEG.js to translate Rockstar code into a JSON uh, object, which is the expression tree or the syntax tree for the language. And then a uh, metacircular evaluator, which then takes that syntax tree and executes it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a tremendous amount of fun because you get to points where you're debugging it and you're like, okay, is this, so I wrote a program, then I wrote a program that turns that program into a different program. And then I wrote a third program that runs the output of the second program. Where's the bug? <laughs> you know, yeah. Is this a bug in my Rockstar code or is it a bug in the way I'm translating Rockstar into JSON or is it a bug in the thing that interprets the JSON and, uh, you know, generates the output and stuff. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I, I got to, you know, what I said, right, this is 1.0, this is done. And, you know, I set up a website for it, which is codewithrockstar.com because rockstar.com belongs to some games company like <laughs> Grand Theft Auto or something. I, I'm not, I'm not hip with the cool kids. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, I launched that and it's just kind of been buzzing along and it's this wonderful, uh, you know, there's a lot of, like, on the one hand, it's some of the most fun I've had writing software in a long time, partly because it is, by design, decoupled from the kind of ethical considerations we're talking about earlier. I'm like, do not use this in production. Like, don't even think about it. You know, we don't have I.O. It'll, it'll take standard in and standard out. There's no networking. There's no file system access. There's definitely no database connectors or anything. And people are saying, how are we going to do this? And i got this big list of ideas that I'm playing around with. Um, first version didn't even have arrays. Um, and I, I did the, the advent of code uh, in December last year. Um, and like the first couple of days, it's like, I'm going to do advent of code in Rockstar. And it's like, oh, I can't. I need a raise. I don't have a raise. All right, I'll add a raise to the language. Um, <laughs> and so there was this massive spike in kind of the Rockstar feature set. Um, and, uh, you know, coming up with, okay, how do you design the syntax? Well, uh, what if we do list collections? We've got push and pop, but that doesn't sound, so let's, let's do rock and roll instead. So rock will put something into a collection and roll will yeah. pull it off the collection, like, you know, push and pop or shift and unshift, these kind of things. Um, Mainly because I wanted Rock You Like a Hurricane to be a, a line of code <laughs> that actually worked. Um, so, and, you know, that's the fun part. Right? You're like, is there a lyric somewhere in the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the whole rock and heavy metal genre that that line could become my idiomatic example for how this piece of code should work? Um, and it's, it's fun. It's a very kind of creative process. Um, but it's also, you know, a lot of people have just really enjoyed finding out about it. Um, the, the biggest testament, I think, to this is the number of people I've seen who have one sticker on their laptop. 
you know, there's some people their laptop is pristine and other people, you know, like me, they got stickers plastered all over it. But I've seen lots of people, they got one sticker and it's the certified Rockstar developer sticker that I give out at conferences. And I'm like, if you say you don't want any stickers at all, but you break the rules just for this one, then that's kind of, that, that says something to me about the, the way this is connected with people, which is, is kind of fun, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it brings, like, it brings the fun back to yeah. development. Like you were saying, you know, we spend so much time, at least, you know, if you're in, say, web development or, uh, a forms app, you're doing forms over data. You're just doing help this person to fill this form in, to store some data yeah. in the database, run a, run a report. But if you're able to then go, Hey, there's this, there's this whole other part of me that I'm into. Yeah. There's song lyrics, pop lyrics, rock, rock lyrics, whatever, jazz, blues, whatever. Yeah. And I can turn that into something creative. Someone else has done the hard part of making it all rhyme, but if I just sort of tweak it a little bit and make Fizzbuzz or yeah. make some program that outputs, even if it just writes the word hello on screen or something, you know, something yeah. silly like that, it's this huge step towards making it fun again. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I know so many developers who are, we talk about the nine to five developer and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, for a lot of people, it's a job. I do it to get paid and then I go home and do whatever I do. But it's maybe, being given the opportunity to do something fun in a similar situation would make them want to go right. I want to take this a uh, take it to the next level, or yeah. take it. I don't want to say more seriously, but you know, what I mean, add that sort of fun to it. You know, there's a reason why we have airsoft guns and Nerf guns and things like that because it's kind of a bit fun to just go ah and shoot somebody yeah. with a with a rubber bullet or a, a foam bullet, knowing it's not going to hurt them. But it's kind of fun to kind of catch people off guard, and I think that's kind of what Rockstar has managed to do. It's caught people off guard by going, "Hey, there's this fun thing you can do. Go check it out." Yeah. And it's also, you know, I think the, um, you know, take, I don't know, welding, for example. You know, there are lots of nine to five welders who, you know, welding is how they're, they're good at it. They turn up on a building site or their sheet metal fabrication, whatever. They do their job well. They go home. You know, what do you do? I'm a welder. No, come on. What do you really do? Oh, you know, I, I play golf and I hang out with my kids and I, I read military history or, you know, welder I'm constructing in my head right now. Yeah. But then, you know, there's also amazing art out there which would not exist without the the engineering discipline or the, the craft of welding. Um, and, you know, the fact that it, it is incredibly practical and useful should not be a boundary to using it as a form of expression if that's the way that you feel like you can express the ideas and, you know, whether that's humor or sculpture or, you know, whatever. Um, Technology is, is the, the boundaries of it are being pushed in all sorts of directions by all sorts of things. And, you know, I think art and creativity is a completely legitimate excuse to say, well, what are the limitations of this technology? You know, is it a learning tool? Is it a way of identifying, you know, maybe some constraints or edge cases in our existing languages, which you wouldn't have found just doing kind of, you know, nine to five enterprise development kind of things. So... So I want to talk about .NET now. Yes. And, uh, no, uh, absolutely. That was going to be my next thing. Like, you, we talked on Twitter about, well, you mentioned yeah. it in passing about you're making a, a, I don't want to say parser. Is that the correct way? Is it a parser? Is it a transpiler? Is it an interpreter? It's, like, so the, the, the approach I've taken with, with Rockstar, so the, the, basically there's three schools. There's parsers, um, which just take some code and they verify that it's legit and valid. And then they output something. And uh, you effectively, there are transpilers, which they take Rockstar in and they output something like Ruby or Python or whatever, which you then run on your Ruby or Python interpreter. Um, compilers are things which take source code and they generate machine code for a particular architecture. And then interpreters, they take source code and they, um, they run it and tell you what it does. So uh, something like Ruby, for example, um, or most of the scripting languages we use, um, they don't ever compile down to native machine code. They run on top of an interpreter layer, which gives you brilliant kind of flexibility and cross-platform compatibility, because you can run a Ruby program on any machine which has a Ruby runtime on it. Um, but they have overheads with performance, because when you run your program, you're actually running two programs. You're running your program, and you're running the interpreter it sits on top of. Um, and stuff like .NET and Java, they kind of have a hybrid of this approach because the your program, your C-sharp or your Java program, compiles to intermediate what's called bytecode. And then that bytecode runs on a runtime, which is the .NET common language runtime, or in Java, it's the, the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. Um, 
And then, you know, classical languages like C, the convention there is you compile C for Windows, you get a .exe file that runs on Windows, you compile it for Mac OS, you get a compile a, a executable binary. Um, but, you know, you can take a, uh, like a Ruby program and run it on a Raspberry Pi, and you can take the same Ruby program and run it on a Mac, and that works fine. If you want to do that with .NET, you have to compile it twice for different outputs. Um, and compiler engineering, I, I've not yet got into the whole bit where you have to generate machine code level instructions. Um, so Rockstar at the moment is an interpreter. So it is a, a JavaScript program that takes Rockstar programs and interprets them and produces, tells you their output. Now, up until now, like I said, it's been, it's been built in JavaScript. Now, I, I started working on a, a .NET interpreter um, for a, a talk I did at a couple of conferences last year about parsing esoteric languages using .NET. There's a, a, a NuGet package called Pegasus, which does the parsing expression grammar, which is the heavy lifting part. And then there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do. Building an abstract syntax tree in an untyped language like JavaScript is hard because you have to rely on strings to denote what kind of instruction it is and what type it is and where the arguments go. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy working in JavaScript very much. I also enjoy working in, in .NET. And uh, so I, I got about three quarters of uh, the language syntax supported in a uh, .NET thing. Um, but then the really interesting thing that's happened is Blazor, because Blazor will, I believe in May this year, Blazor will target WebAssembly officially. It's in preview and kind of experimental support at the moment, and you can run Blazor on the server and use um, uh, WebSockets or RX or Signal something. or something Signal like that. Signal R, yeah. that's it. Yeah, so you can run Blazor on your server and use Signal R to update the browser. But when Blazor targeting WebAssembly becomes officially supported, now at that point, it means that you would be able to write a Rockstar parser and interpreter in .NET compile it via Blazor to run in WebAssembly and host it in the browser. So you get the, you know, the, the one you don't have to pay hosting fees for running <laughs> silly joke languages in your own infrastructure because your, your users are running it on their own system. But you get, you know, immediate feedback. You get browser native performance. It's running in their environment. So the security headaches are all on that side of it and these kinds of things. Um, but the code you have to write and maintain is C sharp with all the brilliant stuff like uh, you know switch statements based on type inference, which is a lovely, lovely feature. You're like I've got a thing, uh, look at it, and if it's a type of this, do that, and if it's a type of this, do that, and type of this, do that, um, and you know that kind of syntax is brilliant for building evaluators because effectively what you're doing is iterating through a tree and going right, what's next? It's a print statement, okay run this block of code. What's next? It's an if statement. All right, evaluate the condition. All right, what is it? True. Okay, evaluate the um, next bit. Run that. Tell us the output of that. Um, and, you know, this is this wonderfully elegant recursive functions calling into it, each other, calling back into themselves, um, which is, you know, the, the .NET type system is actually a, a very, very nice way of expressing those kind of, of behaviors and, and constructions and things. Um, and yeah, now that the, the roadmap says that C sharp down to WebAssembly and running in through the Blazor runtime is going to be supported, it's probably a good time to do, you know, Rockstar 2.0 <laughs> in C sharp or maybe F sharp. I don't know. It might be time to, you know, learn a whole bunch of new things. Yeah. Um, right. But then target WebAssembly as, as the output so that it'll run natively in web browsers. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a nice, I've always learned by solving problems. I've never been much good at like reading textbooks or tutorials. Um, and to me, getting Rockstar running in .NET, in Blazor, in a web browser is a problem that is interesting enough that I will happily put the hours in to figure out how to make this happen. Um, so that's very definitely on my, the, the technical side of the, the Rockstar roadmap for 2020. Um, so, uh, yeah, Rockstar in .NET Core running in Blazor, in WebAssembly, is it a you know, fascinating engineering project that pushes the boundaries of software development, or is it a waste of time and a joke that's gone way too far? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that you can say Rockstar in Blazor in WebAssembly using C Sharp in the browser. That's a sentence you couldn't say three years ago. Yeah, I know. There's, that's mind-blowing to me. And right? the whole thing will probably be developed on macOS. Exactly, um, right? You know. Because that's that's what I'm, I'm running 90% of the time these days. I did actually, I got a, a Surface Pro a couple of months ago, which is a lovely, lovely device. Um, and it's really funny jumping between <laughs> Windows and Mac OS. 
Um, I grew up on Windows since, you know, Windows 2.0, whatever. Um, and the best way I think I can describe it now that, you know, Windows 10 on kind of tablet devices is almost there. And it's like Windows is full of design decisions I agree with that haven't quite been implemented properly. And Mac OS is full of design decisions I disagree with that are implemented really well. <laughs> like the Mac OS windowing system is absolutely rock solid, 100% reliable, and I hate it. <laughs> because you can you can kill all of the windows that belong to a process. The process is but still the process running, still yeah. shows up in your task switcher. Yeah. So you can command tab into something and go, well, where is it? Do I is it here? Is it fallen off the edge of a monitor? Um unlike Windows multi-monitor support, you want a window that's or an application stretching across two screens. Easy, just drag it across two screens. Mac won't let you do that. Um and you know, Windows, you sometimes do it and it goes horribly wrong because it can't work out whether it's on the high DPI or the low DPI screen, and so you get really garble typefaces and all this kind of stuff. Whereas Mac OS, you never see that, but it just won't even let you try. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, .NET Core in Mac OS using Visual Studio Code, which is a brilliant open source editor from Microsoft, um, running .NET Code to compile Rockstar into WebAssembly to run on Blazor in a browser, is almost all stuff that maybe five years ago didn't exist, you know, would have been unimaginable. Um, and now it's like, yeah, we, we can do that. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, Just like brilliant. being literally at the forefront. Yeah. It's amazing. When you're, when you're at the leading edge, the bleeding edge, I suppose, there are no limits. Yeah. You know, everybody talks about there's no limits in technology. Well, there really aren't. And especially if you're at the, well, there's still, you know, if you're still yeah. sort of, uh, I think Hanselman says that, you know, Microsoft's a bit like an oil tanker. It's shifting slowly. If you are in that situation where you're in a big enterprise and you're shifting slowly, you can still see that there are no limits, yeah. but it's harder to see that far into the future. Whereas if you're at the bleeding edge, yeah. you are the limit. You know? And I think, you know, it's an interesting, you know, I, I've been following um, Scott Hanselman particularly, but, you know, a lot of the other people who were, um, people who were very influential in the earliest days of Microsoft embracing .NET. So, you know, the, the team, uh, Hanselman, Rob Connery, Phil Hack, and uh, I can't remember who the fourth one was. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but it was basically the, the four people who built the first version of ASP.NET MVC. I think it might have been Scott Guthrie of yeah. ASP.NET MVC. And I said, this is going to be open source. Um, and, you know, the, the analogy there of steering the oil tanker, you know, uh, the only reason why the, the Microsoft juggernaut is changing direction is that there are people like that who every time they try and straighten up, they go, no, 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 come on, keep it to the left, keep it to the left. Um, and, you know, it, it's Microsoft open source is an incredibly kind of interesting, it's, you know, controversial in the sense a lot of people have different opinions on who's doing what and what's in it for them. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, it, it kind of, it makes sense that it's very easy to see a, a a point in time, maybe five years from now, where all software is effectively free, um, you know, because you can duplicate it at zero cost. You know, if you have a copy of Photoshop and you want another one, you copy the binary for millicents worth of electricity and disk space. Um, so, you know, there's, there's no kind of manufacturing supply chain infrastructure to speak of. And so you have to look at what are going to be the, the stable revenue sources for technology companies um, and you know you can copy code for free but then you need to run it somewhere which means either you need physical hardware so you know laptops smartphones embedded devices all these kinds of things are all still growing massively or you need cloud um, and you know obviously with with Azure Microsoft is a serious contender we are one of the, the big four if you count Alibaba um, in the the cloud hosting space and it makes perfect sense to me that they're like if happy developers end up falling into the Azure pit of success, that generates revenue for us. So what do we do to make developers happy? They want great tools. All right, we'll build them. They want open source. All right, we'll build that. They want to run on Linux and Mac OS. Okay, we'll build that. They want to transpile to Raspberry Pis. Okay, we'll build that. Um, and, you know, the, 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 like I said, this is, this is my kind of uh, looking at it from the outside. Um, that makes sense to me. People are like, why are they doing open source? It's like, because developers want it, and Microsoft want you to run stuff on Azure. Um, and, you know, you have to realize as well that, you know, Microsoft are the only one of the big three who are still like, we do technology. We have no interest in being a grocery store. We're not building self-driving cars and trying to open our own taxi company. Uh, you know, you look at Amazon, 
any company you host on Amazon, it's only a matter of time before they go, actually, we're going to do your thing now. Yeah, um, right. You know, the, when Amazon acquired Whole Foods, I heard some really interesting stories from, you know, big uh, high street grocery stores, like, you know, food shops in the UK, who are like, we host everything on AWS. We're now funding a, a direct competitor of ours for the privilege of keeping our own website up. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the, the competition there between... Uh, you know, I think Amazon's a, a fantastic company because I remember how awful mail order was before they fixed it. Um, and I use Amazon to order things all the time now, and I host stuff on AWS. And um, but you know, I I, I I like the Microsoft kind of ethos of we are going to do technology really well. And yes, we are going to charge you money for it, but we're going to charge you money for the bits that ideally scale with your revenue. It's the great thing about cloud hosting. If you have no customers, you have no traffic, so it doesn't cost anything. If you start getting customers, and at that point, if your business model is sound, the customers generate the revenue, which you, so it's part of a, you know, kind of fairly transparent supply chain of, of supply and demand. Um, so, but yeah, you know, Microsoft is certainly, Microsoft today is a very, very different Microsoft to the one I remember from the, the 90s, the early 2000s. Um, and .NET is very, very different. And, you know, the world of open source is very different. And it is exciting it's a still a tremendously exciting time to be kind of you know involved with it all so so when can we possibly i mean you mentioned you mentioned earlier on it's on the roadmap yeah is there a is it it'll be done when it's done or is there a defined goal i want to have something that runs in blazor in WebAssembly on the browser that's written in rockstar by this date so i nominally have a target of having this ready when blazor officially ships so when Blazor comes out of preview, which mm -hmm. I think is, last I heard it was going to be about May, but don't quote me on that. Go and look it up. Sometime. Of course, yeah. Um, but it, it should be the first half of this year. Um, and that's specifically the WebAssembly target for Blazor projects. Um, and, you know, I, I would very much like to have uh, Rockstar in Blazor ready to go at that point. Sure. One, because it gives me a deadline to kind of structure my own time around. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, I've just started up my own consultancy thing. Um, if I get inundated with people wanting to pay me to do stuff, then I'm not going to turn down interesting paying work to play with Rockstar. If anyone wants to pay me to do Rockstar, <laughs> now we're talking. You know, maybe yeah. get like a, an arts grant or something. <laughs> um, but no, I, 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 you know, I'm also putting together some training material around Blazor. I'm going to be running some some workshops on it uh, over the course of this year. Um, so the, the timing is serendipitous, and okay. I, I hope to have Rockstar 2.0 in Blazor in a browser when it does release to manufacture or whatever they call it these days, um, which should be within the, the first half of this year. Um, so yeah, watch this watch this space. I suppose it would make for really interesting demos as well, because like there's only so many times you can do. And here's the pizza shop. Here's the uh, nerd diner. Here is yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those you know kind of to almost come full circle and talk about ethics a little bit. Um, there's an interesting question around the value of you know I, I put it this way. I would never ever want somebody on one of my teams to write their own parser based on something they saw at a conference. You know, I think if you teach people things like parsing expression grammars and esoteric languages, um, you are running a very real risk that somebody who perhaps doesn't have the, the experience or the context will take that knowledge away and use it to, you know, five years later you end up with a company where they're... Um, you know, order procurement system is written in an esoteric language that was invented in-house with a compiler somebody built because it was interesting. Sure. Um, and there is, I've seen a lot of, um, I'm not sure what, problems, risks, challenges, um, which come because of, of the, the, the pattern that happens in our industry where someone's like, I'm going to use technology X on my next project because I want to learn it. Um, and so they learn it, but the thing which ends up going into production and having to be supported and maintained was built by somebody who didn't have the background or the experience really to understand what they're doing. Um, and sometimes that approach works, and sometimes it clearly fails, but also a lot of the time it works well enough that they ship it because they can't justify canceling it or rebuilding it from scratch. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm very, very conscious that if you, you know, approach a room full of people and go and do a workshop on how you build compilers in .NET, um, there's a risk one of them is going to go back to work and build their own compiler. Exactly. Um, right. And then, you know, probably 
do a pretty good job on it. But the last thing we need as a, as a society is more companies running weird esoteric technology that nobody else has ever heard of. And that being the reason why your website crashes at three o'clock in the morning when someone's trying to get into law school. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, you know, the technology and, and, uh, the kind of education for the sake of understanding is one thing, but also we want to teach people things that are genuinely useful and applicable to what they do. Um, so, yeah. And I think we're just about out of time. I think we are, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. But uh, like I said, thank you ever so much for no, having a chat with me. Thank you, Jamie. That was absolutely delightful. It, it was so. really amazing from my point of view. Just like all of the stuff that we covered, the, the art side of it, the fun side of it, all the technology involved. It's amazing. Uh, hopefully, we can maybe catch up again once the interpreter's out yeah. uh, and it's running in, in Blazor. Absolutely. Uh, maybe we can talk about it again. I don't know. Great stuff. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. That was my interview with Dylan Beatty. Be sure to check the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at dotsnetcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. Also, don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review in your podcatcher of choice. Um, head over to dotsnetcore.show forward slash subscribe for ways to do that and to come back next time for more .NET Core goodness. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks. The .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited. 